Shalom, shalom, my Habarim. Greetings, my YouTube mishpaha. What's up, what's up, my people? And welcome, or welcome back, to Bible on a Bicycle. Supercuts! My name is Will, and I'm an aspirant follower of Yeshua HaMashiach. That is, Jesus Christ. What is a Supercuts fan at it? Well, Supercuts is where we tackle a particular subject or topic within the pages or surrounding the Bible, whether that be one of theology, creeds, doctrines, cultural context, or historicity. And then firstly and foremost, we open up our Bibles, take it to the scriptures, read them for ourselves within context when applicable. And then I go out so you don't have to, and I gather up the varying and oftentimes opposing ideologies, philosophies, teachings, and preaching of various scholars, theologians, philosophers, preachers, and teachers. And I bring that all together, and I chop, 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 chop that all up, and then through the magic of editing, I smoosh all that right back together into something that's hopefully cohesive and intelligible, and that I serve right up to you in the form of a supercut. And in this here particular little video, we're going to stick with the subject of the Ark of the Covenant. In last week's video, we explored the controversial claims of Ron Wyatt and his discovery of the Ark of the Covenant beneath the supposed crucifixion site of our Lord and Savior. And that proved to stir up a lot of conversation down in the comments. But sticking with that theme of the Ark of the Covenant, I thought that this week we take a look at another auspicious internet claim concerning the Ark, and that is, is the Ark of the Covenant some kind of laser weapon of doom from God? I'm going to get the input from two of my favorite individuals, starting with the late, great Dr. Michael S. Heiser, and then we'll go to the other side of the spectrum, to the psychological aspects, and get the philosophical teachings of Dr. Jordan Peterson. As always, make sure you got your Bibles handy so you can open up, follow along when necessary, and maybe get your little pen and paper or open up notepad, whatever you want to do. Make sure you got a way to take some notes as I turn it over to these gentlemen. And we ask the question, is the Ark of the Covenant some kind of doomsday laser weapon from God? Alrighty. The Bible, of course, clearly associates the Ark of the Covenant with the presence of Yahweh, the God of Israel. All you have to do is read Exodus 25, 22 to get the distinct impression that that's really what the Ark was about. So is there any truth to the Ark of the Covenant being some sort of ancient death doomsday weapon? And does it have a history? What was the Ark of the Covenant? Well. In most general terms, it was a sacred object in ancient Israelite religion. The Ark of the Covenant was a lidded, gold-leafed wooden chest containing the two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. A more precise description is found in the Old Testament book of Exodus, specifically Exodus 25, 10 through 22. Even more specifically, getting into the details, the Ark was a box made of acacia wood overlaid with gold plating inside and out. It measured roughly two and a half cubits in length, yeah, that's a little under four feet, three foot nine to be exact, by one and a half cubits wide and one and a half cubits high. One and a half cubits is about two feet three inches. The edges of the ark had gold molding and rings were attached to each corner on the long sides so that it could be carried by means of poles without touching it, which was of course absolutely forbidden. When the Israelite camp was stationed and not traveling through the wilderness, the ark was housed in the most holy place or the holy of holies. That was the inner square room of the mobile tabernacle structure. In transport, the Ark was concealed under a large veil made of skins and blue cloth, carefully hidden even from the eyes of the priests and the Levites who carried it. 
When at rest, a portable building, the tabernacle, meaning residence or dwelling place, was set up to house the ark. It was built of woven layers of curtains along with 48 boards clad with polished gold standing like vertical blinds. Solomon's temple in Jerusalem superseded it as the dwelling place of God some 300 years later. God's presence in the form of a cloud would hover over this spot, also known as the Tent of Meeting. The ark had a lid, the Hebrew term for that is kaporet, made of solid gold to which two angelic cherubim were fixed. Now, English translations refer to the lid as the quote-unquote mercy seat, for instance, Exodus 25, 22. The translation is sort of odd since the Hebrew term for the lid, kaporet, comes from a verb, kiper, that has nothing to do with mercy. In Hebrew, the verb kiper means to atone or better, to purge or cleanse. The ark was part of a ceremony we'll discuss in a moment that involved the concept of allowing access to Yahweh, Israel's God, which is probably why translations associate it with mercy. God was said to have spoken with Moses from between the two cherubim on the ark's cover. Since God promised to appear over the lid of the ark, it became perceived as God's throne. This is a bit imprecise since the ark was also called God's footstool in 1 Chronicles 28.2. The two conceptions though, throne and footstool, are compatible since ancient thrones of the period from other civilizations had a footstool that was actually part of the throne. The design clarity of that point is important because the tablets of the law given to Moses were placed inside the ark. According to various texts within the Hebrew Bible, it also contained Aaron's rod and a pot of manna. This practice mirrors how ancient Near Eastern kings would deposit covenant treaties made with other nations inside the footstool of their thrones. Since the law was the basis for the covenant relationship between Yahweh and Israel, the ark, this box, became known as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, according to Numbers 14.44, for example. There has to be a bridge between the finite and the infinite. There has to be a place where the ephemeral meets the eternal. There has to be a bridge between the knowable and the unknowable. And there has to be bedrock at the foundation. The Ark which is the portal to God, is to be carried on the shoulders of those who are holy. It is not to be touched. To touch the ark is to risk death. Aside from serving as a repository for the tablets of the law given to Israel at Mount Sinai, according again to the book of Exodus, the ark had other purposes in Israelite life. The Ark of the Covenant was associated with Israelite ritual, war strategy, and divine revelation. First, according to Leviticus 16, the Ark was the central object of the annual Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. That was a ritual that had central importance to the people of Israel. This was the only day of the sacred Israelite year that the high priest could move beyond the veil that blocked access into the most holy place where the Ark was stationed. And we can read about that in Exodus 26 and 1 Kings 8. Second, because the ark was associated with the very presence of Yahweh, the God of Israel, it was at times taken out onto the battlefield against Israel's enemies. 1 Samuel 4, 3 is a good example. On some of these occasions, miraculous events did occur, such as the parting of the Jordan River in Joshua 3, verses 8 through 17. Lastly, God would also dispense information when appearing in a cloud above the ark. Exodus 25, 22, Exodus 30, verse 6 are examples. So consequently, the ark had a kind of oracle function as well. There are holy things that cannot be touched except at mortal risk. Those things that cannot be touched are at the very foundation of the community. The ark must be placed at the center of the temple. The temple must be placed at the center of the community. 
The community must be arranged around what is untouchable and unshakable. So, was the Ark a death ray, a death weapon? There isn't a single verse in the Bible that describes the Ark emitting any sort of beam or death ray. Some people, though, would point to two occasions in the Bible where people died because of the Ark. There's an example in 2 Samuel 6, 5 through 10, where Uzzah touches the Ark to steady it and is struck dead. The second one is the men of Beth Shemesh incident. They die after looking into the Ark which requires removing the lid and thus touching it. So yes, God was serious about punishing people who touched the ark. It was his primary sacred object. But for it to be a weapon, you'd have to put it on the battlefield with a sign that said, don't touch me, because that's the only way that it's lethal. Many biblical scholars have wondered if the Ark of the Covenant derived from an earlier ancient Near Eastern holy object the Egyptian palanquin. While styles varied, Egyptian palanquins can account for all of the structural elements of the Ark of the Covenant. Egyptian palanquins were boxes made of wood, often plated with gold. They were at times carried by means of poles by priests, and they gave oracles. They dispensed divine revelation, and at times had winged deities or creatures painted on their short sides. An Egyptian antecedent to the Ark of the Covenant actually makes good sense in terms of the historical context of the Exodus from Egypt, which is the setting for the Ark of the Covenant's creation. Moses was, after all, raised in Egypt in the biblical story, and the Ark was actually built by a Hebrew who had learned his craft while, you guessed it, in Egypt as a slave. It's overstated to think that the Ark was an Egyptian palanquin. But the Egyptian palanquin seems to have served as a model for the Ark of the Covenant. In the end, the Ark of the Covenant was one of Israel's most important sacred objects, but it wasn't a doomsday weapon. You might wonder what happened to it. Many do. So there you have it. The Ark of the Covenant is not some kind of laser weapon from God. If anything, it's one of the many, many ways in which our uncreated creator chose to try to communicate and commune with us in the past. But in my opinion, once Yeshua came here proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, laid down his life as the ultimate atonement, overcome death itself, and ascended to the Most High, leaving us with a helper in the form of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, we no longer need such things as temples, tabernacles, rituals, and or sacred items such as the ark. Because now God dwells with us through the Holy Spirit within us. Do you not know that your body is a temple? Anyway, that's my opinion. I'd be interested in knowing what you have to say about the Ark of the Covenant. So why not give us a little bit of fellowship? Leave us a comment down below. While you're down there, if you're not already, why not take the time to hit that subscribe button, give us a little love with that thumbs up, and make sure that you hit that share button. And share this little video with any friends or family members that you think might benefit, or enjoy this little video as well. It'll only take you a second, but it goes a long way in helping small, struggling little YouTube channels like this. They're out to promote folks opening up their Bibles. I mean, the YouTube algorithm, well, it doesn't think it's quite as important to get the word out there as we know it is. Big shout out to all you subscribers, both new and returning. And a huge thank you to everyone who continues to support this here little YouTube channel and the ministry we do, whether that be through a membership here on this channel, one-time donation through PayPal, all you good folks over there on the Ko-Fi. On behalf of everyone that it's helped here locally, we really do appreciate it. And as always, thank you, that's right, you watching this here right now, for joining us here today. I know your time is valuable, and I really do appreciate you spending a little bit of it here with us, opening up our Bibles, and taking a look at some of the more strange and unusual parts of the Scriptures. Hope to see you here next time, and until next time, 
Remember, Yeshua, Jesus loves you. And so do I. Now get off of here, go ride your bike, and read your Bible.